In this video, we're going to look at the reduction and oxidation of carbohydrates. And while these reactions don't have a lot of independent value on their own, they're sometimes used as kind of a means to synthetic ends, they do teach us the important lesson that carbohydrates react as if they have a lot of their open chain forms around because there is a little bit of that open chain form around in a solution of a carbohydrate that can form an open form, that has a hemiacetal in the closed form. And the carbonyl groups in those open forms can be reduced, or in the case of aldehydes, oxidized up to carboxylic acids via reactions and mechanisms and reagents that we've seen previously for reduction and oxidation. So for example, we can hit an aldose or a ketose with sodium borohydride to get a reduced product containing a new hydroxyl group and a new alcohol functional group. We already know that sodium hydroxide reduces ketones and aldehydes to secondary and primary alcohols. The exact same reaction can occur in carbohydrates via the open chain form. So for example, D-glucose is in equilibrium with a small amount of its open chain form. And when we hit with sodium borohydride, well, the borohydride anion is a source of nucleophilic hydrogen, right, or hydride. That hydride can add to the carbonyl carbon, and we can we will then end up with an alkoxide, which is protonated by water, and we get a neutral product in which a reduction has occurred. If we look at carbon one, carbon one here is at the aldehyde oxidation level to start, but becomes part of an alcohol in the product, a reduction has occurred. And the reduced product that we get when we reduce an aldose or a ketose to something that contains only hydroxyl groups is known as an aldatol. For example, the reduced product from glucose is known as glucitol. Now, here we're looking at reduction of an aldose where we don't create a new stereocenter. Notice that the anomeric carbon, carbon one, becomes a CH2 group. So no new uh, stereocenter is created. But if we're reducing a ketose, we might get a mixture of stereoisomeric aldatols. So consider the reduction of D-fructose with sodium borohydride. Mechanistically, the reaction is exactly the same. The only difference is we're looking at a ketone here rather than an aldehyde being reduced, but otherwise we're gonna add hydride into the carbonyl carbon as we've done many times before, kick the electrons up to oxygen and protonate the O- minus to get an alcohol. But the key thing to recognize now is that this addition creates a stereocenter. Notice that while this carbon is trigonal planar in the starting fructose, in the product, we've now created a stereocenter. And depending on which side of, or which face of the original carbonyl group the hydride adds to, we might get one of two possible configurations here. We might get the new hydroxyl group pointed to the right or pointed to the left. And these are diastereomers. Not only are they diastereomers, they differ in configuration at one and only one carbon, and we know these as epimers. These are epimers. The structure on the left is D-glucitol. In fact, this structure is actually identical to the D-glucitol structure above, but the structure on the right is D-mannitol. Notice the difference in configuration at carbon two which we've seen previously is the difference between glucose and mannose, right, is the difference in configuration there. This happened because of the different orientations that hydride could take in approaching the carbonyl carbon, either from above or from below, leading to these epimeric aldatols. When it comes to oxidation, our first thought might be something like Jones conditions, CrO3 and sulfuric acid. The problem with Jones conditions is that we've got way too many oxygens in carbohydrates to use such a ravenous oxidizing agent as uh, chromium-6, right? That's gonna cause uh, problems for the secondary alcohols, which could be oxidized up to ketones inside the sugar backbone, right? Generally, what we want when it comes to oxidizing carbohydrates is oxidation either only of the anomeric carbon from an aldehyde up to a carboxylic acid, in the case of an aldose, or we want reduction uh, oxidation of an aldose at both ends, at carbon one and carbon six. Carbon six, notice, can be oxidized up to a carboxylic acid as well, since I've got two H's there and an OH. If those two H's were replaced by a carbonyl group, we're at a carboxylic acid. And with respect to the aldehyde, 
you can imagine if this H was replaced to, with an OH, we'd oxidize up to a carboxylic acid. So generally the goal is not to touch these inner secondary hydroxyl groups and only deal with the primary hydroxyl and the aldehyde. If we want to oxidize the aldehyde selectively, we can do so using a reagent known as bromine water, which is exactly what it sounds like, bromine in water at a pH of 6, slightly acidic pH. This causes oxidation of only the aldehyde group to the carboxylic acid. And we won't get into the mechanism in detail, although this is a pretty interesting mechanism that is worth exploring on your own. Think about how bromine could engage with the carbonyl oxygen, for example, to get started on how this mechanism might work. Importantly for our purposes here, this has no effect on carbon-6, on the primary carbon. The primary hydroxyl group is unreactive. And so we end up with a product with one and only one carboxylic acid at carbon-1. And this is known as an aldonic acid. The name is not super important for our purposes, but in a future biochemistry course, you may well hear this term, aldonic acid. This refers to a carbohydrate derivative, derivative of an aldose in which the aldehyde has been oxidized to a carboxylic acid, and the primary hydroxyl group is still there. Somewhat more reactive conditions, stronger oxidizing conditions, will lead to the production of a dicarboxylic acid, which is known as an aldaric acid. And the reagent to use here is generally dilute nitric acid and heat. At the elevated temperature and with the nitric acid, we get oxidation both of the aldehyde and the primary hydroxyl, the primary alcohol, CH2OH group, to carboxylic acids. And we can see that in the product here. This is known as an aldaric or aldaric acid with the two carboxylic acid groups on both ends. But notice, these conditions are still mild enough that those secondary hydroxyl groups remain mostly unaffected. And so the major product here is just the diacid with no oxidation of these internal or secondary alcohols in the sugar backbone. When we treat a general carbohydrate, monosaccharide, disaccharide, polysaccharide, with an oxidizing agent, sometimes reaction occurs and sometimes reaction doesn't. Depending on the structure of the sugar, certain types of sugars react with these oxidizing agents, reducing the oxidizing agent in the process. And because these are capable of acting as reducing agents, these sugars are called reducing sugars. There are other sugars that are unreactive under these oxidizing conditions, and they're known as non-reducing sugars. And the key here is whether we can form a carbonyl group via an open form of the sugar, or we can I and or we can isomerize a ketone to an aldehyde under the reaction conditions. Isomerization of ketoses to aldoses occurs under basic conditions, and we talked about that as the carbonyl migration mechanism previously, right? So a ketose, for example, a ketose with a carbonyl group at carbon two can isomerize under basic conditions to an aldose, and that aldose can react with these oxidizing agents to produce, um, for example, a carboxylic acid at carbon one. And the three conditions listed here are all mildly basic conditions, actually. We've got aqueous ammonia, we've got tartrate, we've got citrate, and under those conditions, we get some isomerization, and we observe some um, reaction of the sugar with, for example, Ag plus or Cu2 plus in the case of these other two reagents, indicating that the sugar, whether it was an aldose or a ketose that I summarized, is a reducing sugar. And so generally, sugars that have a free aldehyde or a ketone that can isomerize to an aldehyde that can form this open form with a carbonyl group are reducing sugars. There are sugars that are non-reducing and these do not have a hemiacetal in their cyclic form. These are known as non-reducing sugars, and this is typical of glycosides where there's no way to open here, right? We don't have an OH, so I can't, for example, deprotonate here. There's no proton to remove from that OR group, so I can't open to form a CO double bond. Because that doesn't occur, we get no reaction with these oxidizing reagents, and these types of glycosides are non-reducing. We'll see examples of disaccharides where both sugars and americ carbons are involved that are also non-reducing. More on that when we talk about disaccharides later.
But just to give a summary and a couple of examples here, D-glucose itself is absolutely a reducing sugar because in the open chain form, it has an aldehyde, which can be oxidized by, for example, silver, silver plus and aqueous ammonia to a carboxylic acid. We would observe that as the plating out of silver zero, right? As the Ag plus is reduced to silver zero, creation of a silver mirror, famous and very fun experiment that people can do with glucose. And so glucose is a reducing sugar. It reacts with oxidizing agents. On the other hand, a glycoside of glucose is non-reducing. If we replace this OH group with an O-methyl or O-ethyl, all of a sudden the sugar is non-reducing because it's not capable of opening to form an aldehyde in an open chain form. It's not capable of forming an aldehyde at all because it's now stuck in the acetal uh, functionality.